ask you gentlemen to see the light through there. It's the same. You're in the light, George. <laughs> yeah, this is production here. See the light. <coughs> All set? Yeah. Bill, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, this has been quite the ceremony today. Yes, this was really something after all these years. Did you uh, get to see guys like Tom Barisi? Well, Tom and I are old friends, and we, we see each other all the time in the course of business. He's with the Chamber of Commerce. I'm still with the, I still have the book note. I, I, I go to bother them every day. My kids are on it. So all but those things that you know all about them back in Silver Creek, do you care to share right now? All those the stories that we never hear? <laughs> well, we, we, uh, we had some good times in Silver Creek. We, we didn't get into too much trouble, and we, we enjoyed it. We, we didn't need a lot to keep us amused uh, in those days. I mean, if we had a bicycle and we had roller skates, even when we were older, that's all we needed. And sometimes we didn't have the roller skates. <laughs> well, you're, very, you're very politic in your answer. Nothing bad about Tom. <laughs> no, no, we, we, were, we were good kids. You're featured in the book, A World War II, Hometown Went to War by Raleigh Killer, Kidder. And what, what was the portion that Raleigh featured in this book? Well, uh, he featured uh, pretty much us going into combat. We were a new division, 75th Division. Mm -hmm. We were brand new. Uh, they called us the Diaper Division because we were so young. We left the States in October, went to Wales, and walked around the Wales countryside for a while until uh, in uh, December, they, all of a sudden they said, we're leaving, we're going to Southampton, going to France. Now, we had no idea of the bulge or anything else, because you know, we're the last people to know. Sure. So they put us on the troop train and uh, boxcars. <laughs> uh, we were concerned we were gonna have to have these hard wooden seats until we found out there were no seats, so we didn't have to worry about that. And we proceeded across France. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, uh, in jerks and fits, you know, the train would stop for a little while and call in nature and, and you'd jump off and then hope that, you know, you, the train didn't leave before you were ready to get back on. <laughs> it was quite an experience. And it was cold. It was winter time. It was one of the worst winters that France had had. Mm -hmm. And we uh, got to the end of the line. We got on trucks and they were taking us up to front. They dumped us off the trucks. We start walking. And all of a sudden, we got in. And nobody told us, you know, like the football game, we'd blow the whistle and say, fellas, we're starting. Right. We thought we were still in the preliminaries. We had eight single rounds of ammunition. Mm -hmm. Single rounds. And we were frontline infantry, which is what we were issued in New York City. Now, you know, with an M1 rifle, eight rounds go in a clip. So at least if you put a clip in, you can go boom, boom, boom eight times. We didn't even have that. We had single ones in our pocket. We had to take it out and put it in. So we, we got clobbered the first night. We lost a lot of people. And nothing we could do but retreat and regroup. And we went on from there. Until I was wounded uh, in Appenware, France. In February, and slight wound, very slight. So I was going to the aid station. The first thing you do, you take your boots off to dry your feet, dry your socks, get warm, and my feet just went, whoosh, swelled right mm. up, and that was the end of the war for me. And you said back to the States? No, no, we went to um, Colmar, hospital in Colmar, and then when they were crossing the Rhine, they evacuated the hospital, and they brought us down close to Marseille. Mm -hmm. And then, th then I was on my way back to the front, and we got the 75th Division the day the war ended. So from your experience in World War II and your friends' experience in World War II, what message would you give to your, your children and grandchildren? Well, I guess the best way to explain it is I hire a lot of young women uh, who are college students. And, you know, we talk and they say, oh, yes, you were, oh, you were 18, you went to war. And now the, the, the fr my male friends, they wouldn't be able to do that at 18. They're not ready. And I said, they would be. And uh, this is uh, uh, September 22nd today. And after the events of September 11th, I go back and talk to them. Now they better, underst now they better understand 
our feelings at that time and how we were ready to go. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the young people of today will be ready if they're called upon and we hope to God that they're not and that, that this thing ends quickly and, and we can return to, to being normal. And that's my hope for them. That's the only thing I can hope for. Them. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. you. Tom, you've had a chance to listen to some of the things of, of Phil's experience, not only running from Silver Creek, but all the way to uh, World War II. As you had a chance to sit down with Riley Kidder, uh, what were your reflections that Riley picked up? I, I think it's primarily frustration and not knowing what's going to happen at the age of 18. Uh, you had little experience in life at that time in 1943. You went to high school, you were on the football and basketball and baseball teams, you went to the proms. Your way of life was pretty well sheltered. And then to throw young boys into a situation like that, which they had no choice, they had to do it. They had to call us up. And uh, those that volunteered, well, our hats went off to them. And uh, the draftees, there were th hundreds of thousands of us. And they had to train us. They had to uh, get us ready for something that was totally strange for us. War, killing someone else. Mm -hmm. And uh, that doesn't come easy to mm -hmm. us. And so uh, it was just uh, you had to learn on the job. The training was fine, mm -hmm. but they had to get people over to Europe and to uh, the Far East because the threat was there, obviously. I suppose nobody can teach you how you're going to react when you've the loss of your friends in the field. No, it's uh, panic settles in, believe me. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had friends that won the Congressional Medal of Honor who never thought they would do it, but that happened. They reacted somehow, which you never would expect. Yeah. And it was great to see it. But uh, most of the time, it was the fear of the unknown. And uh, to have someone in your sights, or uh, you had an ambivalent feeling about it. Mm -hmm. you just, But you were there. You had to do it. Right. Good job. What's your message to your children and your grandchildren? Well, I, as I speak to them uh, constantly, they should get an education. They, uh, if it were not for the GI Bill of Rights, I don't think I'd be here. But that, uh, but to uh, treat yourselves and your neighbors and your parents with respect. If you respect yourself, things are going to work out for you. The younger generation that I spent 30 years, as you know, in education as a principal, those are good kids. Nobody tells us about the good kids. We hear about the kids that have problems. It's like a newspaper reporting on planes that land safely. It doesn't sell papers. They've got to get the other aspects. So let's start emphasizing the positive things that kids do. And the younger generation will meet any challenge that's thrown at them. I believe that sincerely. Terrific. Thanks, Tom. You bet. Appreciate it. Well, see you guys. <coughs> Thanks, Tom. We meet again. We meet again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's Tomasini. That's yeah. Tomasini. You're, yeah. you're, um, he was a little one when I went. <laughs> Don't you always like to hear that? Like some some lady says, well, I used to babysit you and change your diapers. diapers. <laughs> Don't go that far. <laughs> Don't go that far. That'll 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 get edited. I'm telling you. Uh, I'll I'll <laughs> Riley, well, congratulations again. Thank you, Greg. It's, uh, it's been a terrific it's ceremony today, and Riley Kidder is to be commended for sitting down and 
grabbing these personal stories which uh, are, are so remarkable. Once again, he did a tremendous job of uh, making the presentation and I couldn't help but reflect back to when we put out, or he put out the first edition and we were invited to Chautauqua. Mm -hmm. And uh, what a wonderful uh, feeling and emotions and appreciation of uh, the people there and also the veterans who were uh, there and represented. So again today, um, it's great to get back with some of the fellows that uh, of course we've known for years from school and uh, as we've heard here, the sheltered lives and uh, just going to school and uh, the comments that we've heard about uh, the, the good children and uh, we don't hear so much about them but I think that uh, the last 10 days or 11 days have brought out a lot of positive reactions from uh, young people and probably some of the older. I know one of the fellows asked me today, uh, what was your reaction when that, uh, on the 11th of September? And I said, I couldn't help uh, but recall the Japanese kamikazes coming into our uh, camp uh, on Okinawa, especially. We had it before that, but on Okinawa, toward the end of the war, all of the young Japanese who were sacrificing their lives and uh, fear and, uh, as we hear, uh, you have the fear, but you've been trained and you basically should know what to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, these memories come back up into our minds and uh, we see George over here every once in a while and I know he worked with your dad and um, the group of us fellows that get together with your dad and the group on Tuesday, uh, we don't talk about World War II. Not basically, it's a good time. Yeah. But today has been good and it's good to see your cameraman and to meet his folks again. Sure. We know him now. What's I think it was a good afternoon. What did, uh, when you talked to Riley, what was the highlight of this particular book? What did you want to make sure that he remembered? Well, of course, my uh, experience was in the Navy Seabees, the construction battalion, and um, there's not a great deal of, we'll call it publicity or knowledge about the Seabees, and uh, I was pleased when he asked if I would... Uh, grant an interview and some pictures and I felt that it was a good way to uh, bring out some of the parts. Uh, I feel it was a small part that I had to do with the war and with the CBs. Um, but we had to, we, we served, as Raleigh has said, it was a world war and the Navy CBs served in a, uh, any amphibious landing in Europe. Uh, the uh, Aleutians, and of course, primarily the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that, my, uh, my interest in the history of the Seabees and the activities, um, Raleigh has brought that up in the book too. And uh, now we look back and say, we're proud to have been a Seabee. Once a Seabee, always a Seabee. <laughs> I think this was a nice afternoon. It brought the people out again, brought them together, and uh, this is what we found again in the last 11 days, the camaraderie and the uh, adhesiveness of the American people coming together. And I trust that uh, we can do this without uh, having to go through the devastations and the deaths and just the emotions of World War II. Exactly. Ah, great. Yeah. This has been super. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. George, can I borrow you for a second? <coughs> yeah, in a minute. Sure. What page are you on, George? 308.
I can't beat that. So yeah. you, uh, you go better, ahead. You better stick around. Yeah. Well, you know, the CVs and the Marines, they got to work together. So yeah, be careful what you, you say. I heard you say something about what's a CV, always a CV? That's the old saying. Oh. You know, try that. that. I thought that was a point for him. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, George. How are you? Now don't go uh, confusing me with a lot of questions. I don't it'll, be, it'll be very easy. First of all, I need your autograph. It's, it's the easiest thing you need to do with I'm going to take this here for a second. Oh, you can have it. <laughs> I think for the... You're doing a good job here. Iwo Jima. Oh, yeah. The hellhole. Why was it the hellhole? Well, first place, it was uh, actually uh, five miles long, one mile wide, and it was supposed to have been secured in 72 hours. That took 36 days. That made hell. Yeah. Too many gaps and too many tunnels, holes. Didn't see anybody. Had to shoot at noises. But <coughs> thank God I made it through. It's an awful lot of fire blasting in the holes. I mean, it's just sort of just blowing them out of this. The yeah, thing. Well, you, you go to our guns and everything else, you could see a little firing from their muzzles, you know, and you'd shoot at that. Yeah. Is there an experience any which you that's sort of been seared in your mind? I don't know. <laughs> every, every day, every second was an experience. Yeah. Every day was different. You heard Tom talk about the fear factor. I mean, it just, I feel, uh, I mean, just day to day, minute to minute, it's just a. I, I don't know of any fear. Yeah. When you're young, you, yeah. you know the job has to be done. You know there's no way out of there. You gotta fight your way out. You just, fear you know, that kind of left your body. Yeah. Yeah. You just more or less was worried more about your body. Yeah. Than your fight. When you sit down and are going to give a message to your your kids, your grandkids about your experience in World War II, what World War II means, what would you say? My wife gives them more advice than I do. I don't. I don't like to talk about it. If they ask a question, I'll get it done. They but they know where Iwo Jima was, right? And still is, right? They know uh, most of the islands in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. They're uh, educated to that. Sure. I'm just happy that they uh, are going to be called for this one. Yeah, yeah. Does this bring back emotion seeing what happened here the last couple of days? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. You got stuff folding in on uh, these poor people. <coughs> you got to be uh, inhuman to uh, not yeah. do it. Be sad about it. That's right. Yeah. Oh, this has been terrific, George. Thank you for taking Thank a few you. moments. You're welcome. Okay. Keep my dad in the straight and narrow, Don. <laughs> I'll see you on Monday. Yep. Straighten him right out. Okay, great. Thank <laughs> you, you very much. Bob. Yeah, get your name back. Bob, what page you on? Uh, well, I just looked it up. I forgot. Two something. You got two. Yeah, it didn't have a. They got a. They got a. Uh, is there an index? Yeah, there's an index. Oh, here you are, Bob. I got it. It is 119. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> you heard the best. That's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> I need first. Of all, I need to have you sign that, Bob. And while you sign there, See you later. thank you, George. I'm gonna get you this. Okay. How are you doing, Greg? I'm doing well. Keeping everybody straight and narrow, Don. Don Parker. Battle of the Bulge. Right. You were there. I was there, right at the start. What's, what's the memory you walk away from, from that experience? Well, I guess there's a couple good ones. Uh, uh, memory, we ran out of food, we ran out of ammunition, ran out of, it was cold, mm -hmm. and it was bad. And uh, we were moving a lot and uh, digging in a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, then all of a sudden, we were surrounded. And ours, we were surrendered by the colonel of our outfit. 
we we didn't have individually, you know, be taken by the Germans, but they had so much uh, artillery firing in on us. And mm -hmm. We got, you know, we saw so many of them, and, and the thing came down to break your rifles, break everything, not let them, in other words, not let them use it. Right, right. So that's what we did in a certain time. Were you disappointed to hear that? I mean, was there a sense that, oh, hey, we better throw in the towel on this one and lose the battle but win the war? Well, it's, uh, it's one of those things you, you see in the infantry, you never know really what's going on. Right. I mean, we knew what was where we were, but we didn't know what was going on maybe 500 yards away. Mm -hmm. But the, the amazing thing was the surprise that we went through with so much German everything, mm -hmm. men, tanks, everything we had. And nobody seemed to realize that it was that big. Right. And then, of course, after that, we, we were marched back for two days. And we saw everything that everybody talks about. Men laying there frozen, mm -hmm. nothing to eat. We can go out and maybe get a rutabaga or something and eat it. But then the big, the big thing was uh, in the program today. They mentioned Christmas Eve, and of course I'll never forget Christmas <coughs> Eve because we were in the forty-eight cars in a sighting and we were bombed. Mm. And those old cars went boom, 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 boom. And it was really, a really, uh, really something that we didn't know if we were gonna get out of that or not. Right. And then they took us on back. And then finally we got back into civilization. <laughs> Where were you on VE Day? VE Day? Well, after we have quite a story there at the, uh, and I should tell these uh, people about it. The, uh, they, we, the Germans were going to move our camp. Mm -hmm. We were all let's put it this way: we were all sergeants in this camp. I don't know if people realize that Germans are very class conscious. They had privates, non-commissioned officers, officers, mm -hmm. big officers, and that's the way we were separated, see. Mm -hmm. They were going to move our camp. We were all sergeants in this camp, sergeants and corporals. Just no officers, no privates. Mm -hmm. And they let word out that they were going to move us, which we knew they were doing, because we had uh, radios and we knew what was going on in the camp. So the fellows in charge of the camp I was in came up with this idea that we had made knives out of wood, had different things, you know. We had time, so we'd sit there and whittle a little knife. Over there. And so they figured that we'd they'd get the, I wasn't one of these top men, but they came out with the fact that when we moved, they would place the men that had the knives every so often. A certain time, there was gonna be a uh, it was going to happen. Sure. Let's put it that way. And then they let it out to the Germans. You know, say, hey, you know what's going on here? <coughs> they got scared. And they never moved us. We were one of the few camps that wasn't moved. Over there. And they were, you know, they marched from back in further and stuff like that. Then the uh, American Army came through and and uh, we thought they were going to knock down the gates, you know, and we were going to be free. They didn't do that. They put up guards. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. See, people don't realize what happened. They put up these guards around us, and, well, they didn't want us loose on the German countryside. Sure. And so they put up the guards. And, and then they ran out of manpower, so they had to ask for people to help them, you know, <laughs> from us. Yeah. Well, some of the guys were in pretty good shape. Yeah, well, that's terrific. What's, 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 they, go ahead, go ahead. 
Then they flew us out. Yeah, they came back. What's the message you want to give to your kids and grandkids? Well, freedom is a wonderful thing. And uh, I think this uh, tragic bombing in New York City is going to really wake us up. It's, uh, people have never seen such uh, bombing like they did down there, of course, with civilians. Of course, mm -hmm. we saw it in the war. But, right. in the, but uh, I hope that they uh, kind of go after these fellows. I don't think they're going to do it bombing. I think they have to go in and get it. They have mm -hmm. to somehow get it. But I think the people today are when the time comes, there'll be another great generation. Mm -hmm. Has been that way all the way through. It's a, war is a terrible thing, and well, we always used to say back then, let the leaders go fight it out, and the people can watch it. <laughs> well, thank you, Bob. This well, has been terrific. Take care. Good, good nice. to see you. Nice to see you again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The tag's over there. Lloyd, you want to join me? Is it Lloyd? <coughs> Thank you. Lloyd, the first question to ask is, what page are you on? No, I don't know. I haven't even found it. I've had it <laughs> once. <laughs> it's alphabetical, Craig. <laughs> I have a seat. Feel free to have a seat, Lloyd. 102. Judge, I'm going to give you that same question, so be prepared. It's a tough one. Is what? Uh, talking to Judge uh, uh. Kasser. <laughs> Go ahead, Lloyd. Have a seat here. I don't know where it is. We'll find it. <clears throat> I had it once, and I forgot the number and the page it was on. had a chance to spend some a little bit of time with with Raleigh Kidder obviously resulted in a chapter of the book this was terrific today by the way you guys it was just wonderful ceremony and very meaningful I thought it was rather nice I haven't indulged much in anything represented military in many years uh, because it's it's rather touching and I tried to forget everything but then, along come Mr. Kidder, and he brought it out, and I'm glad he did because it's, I think it's doing me a lot of good. And especially meeting these veterans that are here today from all different branches. And they went through the same thing. Now, the chapter that you're it's covered here in the book, deals with Bastogne? Bastogne. That's what it covers. Basically, it stayed with the Bastogne. It did. Now, what memory from that experience sort of seared or stayed with you that Raleigh tried to capture here? Every little event stays with you. Now, I've got to remark about that. How many times a veteran is told to forget it? put it in your past. Well, let me say this. If every teacher in the United States could instill the same feeling in all their students that one gets when they're caught up close in front of an enemy tank with just a rifle, it gets your attention. Absolutely. You can't forget it. Yeah. If it's anything to the people, like every battle that we went in, there's always a wiseacre when, when it's over and everybody is sitting back and licking their wounds. There's always a wiseacre to come up with something that kind of a smart thing to break the tension. 
we had a terrible, terrible thing happen last week. All I've heard is terrible, terrible, and, and uh, sorrow. But did they ever stop and consider that there is one small, as small as it is, good thing, it comes from all things, one good thing that happened from that battle, or it's a battle, mm -hmm. last week, is that them rotten sucker, them terrorists, haven't got the guts to do it again. That's right. That's right. If you had a message to give to your family as from your experiences in World War II, what would that be? I've got to say, I tell everybody, work hard. When you train, train hard. Learn all you can learn because you're going to need it somewhere down the line. It's a tough life, no matter what you do. Whatever path you take, it's going to be tough. But work hard and give it your all. You will be happy. That's terrific. That's terrific. Hey, I need to have your autograph this late. It's part of the guest book here. Wait, hang on. What, 27? Okay, I was looking at 107. Judge's Muriel here today? Oh, she was all dressed up and ready, and then her stomach started acting up. Uh, we ate oh, out yeah. last night, uh, and she had some something really rich. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lloyd. I really appreciate this. It's special to have a guy from Forestville, New York. <laughs> My wife's former boss here yes. today uh, and it was, it was fun to read your story having talked to Raleigh uh, and having probably reread what he wrote about you what is it that, that if you had to tell the camera that that special experience uh, uh, that you had in the war that Raleigh tried to capture I don't know what special occurrence there is in any war no day is that special except the ones that are too horrible to remember and of which I haven't spoken for years and years because I don't want any more nightmares about being death charged. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, do you, is that tough for you coming back from the war? You're 19, after VE Day you come back and to just kind of meld back into a normal routine. How could you possibly do that? Well, I got married, mm -hmm. came back, and now am, uh, have applied to law school. Had to go down to New Haven to be interviewed. I was still on terminal leave, so I could wear my uniform and be uh, half price on the train. And uh, I suppose that that and the submarine dolphins and the combat insignia and so forth helped me get into Yale. Then I had to uh, start making money to help put us through law school because $90 a month does not pay very much towards your living in New Haven, even in those days. <laughs> so I was much too busy to think about anything else. And the next thing you know, married back what brought you? I didn't. I know. I don't think that I know what what brought you back here. Was this hometown for you? I I grew up in Silver Creek. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was a lawyer there. He was our assemblyman in 1890. Oh, is that right? Uh, my family has lived in Western New York for closer to 200 than 150 years. All of my ancestors, except my grandfather, Town, who was born in New Hampshire and didn't get out here until uh, 1865. All of the rest of them were here in the 1820s. Don't forget. Yeah. In fact, my great-grandfather, Smith, was born in Wyoming County in 1821. <laughs> so you're here. This is native soil. This is native soil. 
Heck, when my grandfather was studying law, he studied with his cousin, the Cattaraugus County surrogate. I'll be there. I'll be there. You're in the Robert Jackson Center here today. Right. Uh, did your paths ever cross with his or? No. Uh, he, if you'll remember, went to Washington as counsel for the newly formed Securities and Exchange Commission in 1933. And whilst he did occasionally get back to Jamestown, I'm told it was very, very infrequently. Mm -hmm. You didn't go to, did you go to his funeral at all? Do you remember that? I it was, was 1954. I was unable to uh, attend because it was a tickets only play, uh, a venue. <laughs> I understand it was quite a packed house. I've been asking everybody if there's a message to leave to your children, or, and I know them, or their grand, or their children, your grandchildren. Got great grandchildren now too. Oh remember, my word. Uh, what would it be? Well, it's this: I lost a lot of good friends in the war. I lost close to twenty percent of my sub-school class. And I would say to them, that was done. Now don't you let what they did get undone. Terrific. Judge, before you go, I need your autograph. Do you remember your page? I had somebody looked it up for me, and it's 281, I believe. Lee Town Adams, 281, just... You know, for years I've had to be awful nice to Judge Adams. He gave Cindy her first job. Plus, he be the judge for a lot of other reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Judge. You're very welcome. Do my best, Amiro. Will do. And interestingly, you ought to look up in some bookstore a book by Benjamin Buchanan. Now aged 12. My golly. They get it's always oh, published all, all over. I it's will do called that. My Year with Harry Potter. Oh my gosh, it's terrific. Mr. Finley, you want to join us? Take care of the home. Thanks, thanks, Judge. And say hi to Cindy. <laughs> I sure will. Thank you. Yes. Remember your page, Mr. Finley? 199. 199. This is probably the question that everybody's going to ask you. Oh, that's great. When we get done here, I'll get your autograph. Well, thank you, and congratulations. Mm -hmm. They talk about Americans in the Persian Gulf. Yeah. What was your experience, Mr. Finley? What was my what? Experience. Well, we didn't have any fighting in our area. Uh, we were at the southern part of Iran, and so that the railroads came down to within, well, they came down to the, to the docks. Were you in Iran, Iran when the, the Tehran conference occurred? Yeah. Oh, yes, here's the picture. Yep. That's a dock that the seven ships could tie up to, and they even put some out in the river, river and uh, used the crane on the ships to lower the heavy stuff, and then it went upstream to a place across from Basra, uh -huh. which is in Iraq. Right. And then they put them on railroad cars and trucks and uh, <coughs> of course uh, 
this is, like I said, the Shad El Arab, but it's in three sections. What was your role, what was your job there? Me, I had various jobs. First was working on a ship, and uh, we had various fellows that were acquainted with the longshoreman work, and so we were down in the hole, and uh, we had these long cases where the truck chassis were in boxes. And so they came out to the center of the hole, and you, the fellow says, find a sliver of wood. All right. You slid it under the, the box as far as you could get it kicked in. Then you put the cable under that. And when he raised up, I had him raise the cable, then that moved the end out. Oh, is that right? And so we set the uh, other little pieces of wood under that case. Then when they took the next bite, they put the cable around the end of the box and slid it out to the center of the hole and then had it, uh, had it raised up so they could get another board under that end and then they used the two cables to get it out, up and out of the hole. And they loaded it onto, I think it was, uh, sometimes they put them on barges, and then they stuck them to that place, uh, which was across from Basra, right. and put them on the trucks, and then he, he transported ordered them down to a building which was near where I was guarding uh, the stations I mean the, where the troops that came in later were put so that they had a place to sleep and eat before they went north into another camp. I'll be dark. Tell me about Jane Russell. Jane Russell? She couldn't stand the heat. You saw her though. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, she was with Jack Benny. Is that right? And mm -hmm. and so the magazine said someplace in Italy. But when you look look at the figures of uh, those railroad cars, then you know that they're not Italian writing because one is like uh, thicker at the top and narrow at the bottom has a slight curve. So the, then the five is a hard upside down. Right. And the nine is like a, a diamond. Sure. It's just well, a diamond. So I mean, it's the numbers, most generally those were 41, 45 or something numbers on the car. Yeah. And so you get that four, would either be four ones or a, what they use for a one, and then a little thing with a little hook on it. That'll be there. And that would be a two, a three. Yeah. And so that, uh, we had. I worked in a. What but you saw it was part of that. Part of the reason you tell the story is Jane Russell's was there with Jack Benny, and they were at a. a they put on a stage show. Stage show? Yeah. A lot of people? Oh, yeah. We had quite a few there. Then you came back after the war. If you had to give a message to your children or your, your grandchildren about the war, what would it be? Well, I'd say that uh, stand up for your rights. Okay. And so I was the just a PFC, working in the office, taking out waybills for material that was going north. And so this one night, they came in with a load of pig iron. So I didn't know where it was going to go. I had no paperwork to give me to show it. So I called the port transportation office and 
son of a fellow there told me how to fill out the paperwork. So the next day I was in line for the meal, evening meal, and he was dragging me up and down. I said, okay, I'll fix you. So that night when I went in to work, I worked from seven to three. And so I said, we were just guard do on duty. If any big iron comes in, I don't have any paperwork with them. Send them over to that office over there and tell them they'll have to check it or leave it. So they left it to the day shift and the sergeant in there was uh, in charge of the dump came to me the next day after that. He said, how come you turned that truck down? I said, so-and-so was give me a hard time. I told him that I got my information from the Port Transportation Office. Yep. And they said it was wrong. So I said, I said, I fixed him. And he never bothered me again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Great story. Can I get you to autograph this, Mr. Finley? Yeah. See, this is one that was taken, but uh, there is uh, one that shows some In fact, this fellow, I didn't know he was there until after he got back to the States from this point. How oh, ironic. But he... This is Norm Van Vlack, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. His uh, place of business was uh, on this road that goes down to the place where I was guarding and they assembled the trucks in that building. Uh -huh. And he was in charge of that and also getting drivers to learn how to drive them. And they'd fill them up and go, and then he'd take them north into Tehran. From Tehran, they'd either go to the left or to, to the right. Yeah. Riley, would you do one thing for me? Do you, you want to? Put your name up over when you come on. Do you want Rollin to get her? Rolly. Okay, how do you spell Rollin? R O L L Y. R O L L Y. Or you can say Rollin, it doesn't matter. It's up to you. Well, I want you to on the book Rollin, so use Rollin, I guess. R O L L A N D. K I D D E. Yeah. I'll leave you a card. Okay. Yeah. You want a title? No, I just. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, just look at the camera and just raise okay. your hand. Okay. I just want to take this opportunity one more time to thank the veterans who uh, gave us their stories for this book. Uh, the wonderful uh, expression of their patriotism, uh, the reasons they went to war, I think are going to be lessons for future generations. Uh, a great Jamestowner uh, and lawyer, Robert Jackson, at Nuremberg at the end of World War II said the following, the wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. Had it not been for the veterans of World War II, these people would not have been brought to justice. And as the grandchildren and children of these veterans uh, read this book and consider what their grandfathers did uh, back at the time of World War II, I hope they realize that freedom is not free, that it must be defended, and that there will be other people like Hitler and bin Laden and many others coming down the road in history, and that these stories from World War II will help them understand how at least one generation of Americans stood up to defend the principles which have made our country strong. Okay, let's just let me take the tape out. We'll get this book up here. All right. Sounded good.